Do you want to know how a 75-year-old screen printing business went from making $100,000 a month to more than $400,000 in revenue by expanding their business? Watch this video if you want to establish a business that leaves a legacy. In this episode, we're talking to Brent and his wife, Tara, the people behind the lock name Incorporated. Together, they've expanded their family business into lock promo and apparel, and both of their companies have been growing every year since then. If you can't get That's repeat true. business, you don't have a business. We've got huge customers that do huge bulk orders. We're gonna give you a quick sneak peek on how they're made at this manufacturing facility. So we truly get economy of scale. Today, Brent and Tara will talk about how they were able to transition into this family business, the skill sets that you guys need to build an empire of your own, and everything else that businesses need to have in order to succeed. You know, we'll roll out a couple thousand aprons at a time. Go for those bigger customers, I would say, and just work those relationships. And what's your number one tip for great customer service? All right, you guys, without further ado, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and the bell so that you don't miss anything. Let's go say hi to Brent. Yeah, come in. You must be Brent. Paul, how are you? Doing Pleasure well. Pleasure to meet you. Likewise, let's get this done. All right, sounds great, let's do it. You guys were here with the current CEO of Lock Name Inc. Brent, thanks for, for taking this interview. Absolutely, thanks for taking the time. Uh, it's our pleasure, we can't wait to share your story. So let's start with your story, when your grandfather started Lock Name Screen Printing Company and when did you get involved? Yeah, so my grandfather started our company in 1946, uh, wow. came back from World War II, kind of started it with our apron product side of the business. And we soon started printing those shortly after that for companies like Safeway all the way back in the day, 50 years ago. And they're still a customer today. And my father joined him and then I joined in 1992, have been doing it ever since. So Brent, really cool wall. This is your grandfather. That's actually my father. Oh, that is your father. Uh, so okay. yeah, this is my dad. He's probably 24 years old. He's he's now 80. I mean, this is literally going back to early, what, um, you know, AR. I mean, here's his accounts receivable. <laughs> I mean, Vitamilk. That's, I mean, everybody's heard of that. Wild. Safeway is on there. Look you know, Safeway, $117.60, you know. They literally had a sewing machine and they made the first apron and basically went out to local meat markets. And then ultimately the first major supermarket chain was Safeway. Uh, that was in 1950. That's amazing. And uh, you guys keep watching the video because later on Brent and his wife Tara are gonna share an incredible tip hack that you can use in your business as well. Let's go into the difference between your apparel right on yeah. the other side where we'll talk to Tara more about some of the apparel stuff, you guys. And then you're manufacturing here, right? You've got direct to customer there. Mm -hmm. You've got Safeway and Alperson's mm -hmm. here. What's the pros and cons and challenges between the two? Like, what do you like most? What I would say from a business standpoint um, and ease of business, I like the manufacturing side because while we make a number of different apron products and apron materials, the nice thing is once we get a customer on the manufacturing side of the business, they tend to order the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So we truly get economy of scale and it's not changing all the time. Whereas when we go do promo and apparel, you know, they may, a customer may order t-shirts on this order and next they order water bottles and next they order, um, you know, a journal with a pen, and then they want coffee mugs. And, <laughs> oh yeah, we want our other logo on this. And so you're okay. almost reinventing the wheel. I can see that. Many times on each order. And so economies of scale can be more difficult to accomplish over there, other mm -hmm. than getting larger customers, right? I mean, they order more. You guys, we're here with Tara, who is handling uh, more things on the lock promo side of things. And we've got some questions for her. So, Tara, thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, you bet. Uh, let's talk about the average check on the lock promo side for okay. an average customer. Okay. Do you do bulk orders? Why or why not? And then what's the most popular product that you sell most of? Okay. Um, you know, average invoice, I think, for a customer would be, I would say, 500 to 1,000. Wow. I mean, okay. we, we've got huge customers that do huge bulk orders, so I'll talk about that a little bit. But mm -hmm. also, we really do have a minimum order. It takes a lot to set up a job, and so we have to have a minimum order just to cover the cost of the mm -hmm. setups. 
what is your minimum order? Uh, for screen printing, it's 24 pieces. 24, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, was bulk ordering always from the get-go, or did you discover that we should do that, and that's where the profits are and so forth? Obviously, very quick to figure out the bulk orders are where the profit is for sure. That is our bread and butter, but it's also mm -hmm. what we specialize in because we're set up to do large orders. Generally, our customers that do the large orders are like big tech companies or events, people doing events. And so we definitely do a lot of bulk orders. I would say that's the majority of our orders. And what's the most popular thing that you just continue selling out? Uh, teas. Okay. Teas for events. They change every time, different logos every time. But yeah, I would say t-shirts for sure on the screen printing side. Okay, what are the profit margins for tees or just on average on this side of the business? Mm -hmm. We try to do a 40% profit margin 40? Okay. to cover overhead and any commissions for our salespeople. Okay. Let's switch gears and talk about your current monthly revenue for the whole company and break it down for us on the apron side of things. Sure. And then your other business that you expanded to, right? The uh, promo... Uh, the promo and the apparel stuff. So just sure. curious on that. Yeah. So we're, we're um, approximately 400,000 a month. You know, certainly we have times of the year that are busier versus a bit slower here and there, but uh, approximately 250 plus on our, what we would call our manufacturing apron side of the business. And, you know, around 120 to 150, 150,000 a month on what we would term our promo and apparel side of the business. Okay. How did you get your name out there and established your reputation as, hey, now we don't just do aprons, right? Because right? that's what you're known for since right. 46. What platforms did you use, social media? How much money did you spend? Mm. Tell us as much as possible. So before we actually opened the doors and started this division, mm -hmm. we were screen printing for people that knew we had a screen printing department, you know? Uh, the kids' soccer team is like, hey, could you do some sweatshirts for our team or whatever? And be like, oh, yeah, of course, so we can figure that out. just doing it on the side Yeah, kind of just doing it on the side. And, and word of mouth, people knew we could do screen printing. So it's kind of like favor for other businesses. So it started pretty organically like that. And then uh -huh. once we had a lot of our own customers saying, what else do you do? We're like, why not expand into this? We've got all the screen printing equipment. We've got the space, we've got the warehouse. So uh, we officially opened Lock Promo and uh, started that. And quite frankly, a lot of it was word of mouth. Even friends that worked at Zillow when mm -hmm. it was only five employees, you know, just first starting out. Wow. A friend of ours worked for them and they're like, oh yeah, we'll do your stuff. So we really grew with them to where we are now. Go for those bigger customers, I would say, and just work those relationships and you farm into the whole company and you word of mouth really helps a lot. Let's talk about the most important skill set that any aspiring entrepreneur should or could have. And if they're weak on it, like what would you suggest to them where they can improve on it? You know, you just, you have to be organized. I mean, okay. you, you have to have a plan and you have to find a way to stick to the plan. I think sometimes with creativity comes, you know, just your, 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 your target is too big sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I think you just, you, you've got to narrow your target you need to have a plan and you need to make sure you can be disciplined enough to execute your plan. And what do I need to, to execute my plan? The second thing is you ultimately have to be able uh, to delegate. Okay. I, I think the, 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 one of the biggest problems in small business is we're so invested, right, as entrepreneurs and it's our baby. And like for my father, the way we grew was to bring in someone else, which was me, who um, was younger, more energy, ready to go sell. And that's how we we were really able to grow the business. So stop trying to do everything yourself, bring on Absolutely. people that, that can do it better. Absolutely. People love this question, and that is your overhead costs on the printing side versus the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest monthly expense that you have to incur mm -hmm. every day or sure. every month? Sure. So um, overhead, similar to manufacturing in that we need the space. It's a hands-on job. It's a hands-on product. So mm -hmm. we, we need this warehouse space. We need space for all the machinery and for people to work and put these orders together. Our biggest overhead, I would say, besides labor, is the cost of the space here. The are square you leasing footage it? that we need. Yeah, we do. We are, are, we're okay. part owners in our building too, but we, we do lease, yeah. 
Okay. But at least labor and then your lease is the biggest one. Yeah. What would be after that? Just supplies, you know, manufacturing side, it's the materials, everything that goes into making the aprons on that side. Over here, it's the machinery. It's even maintaining the machinery. Right, um, things break down. And the inks and uh, obviously the everything that we're printing too. You guys, if you've ever been to Costco and you've seen these red or white aprons, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're gonna give you a quick sneak peek on how they're made at this manufacturing facility. So Brent, take it away. Yeah, so obviously it comes in on rolls. Um, you know, we take the rolls and we just mount it up on our spreading machine here. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be your assistant right now. All right, here, I'll up. pull it over and, and yeah, we'll just put it right up in the okay. in there if you wanna put it in there. Yep, I got it. Okay, so spreading machine goes up and down the table. You know, we'll roll out a couple thousand aprons at a time. And then we slowly, once we get that done and it's about a hundred high or so, then we'll put our pattern on top of it. And we do literally manually cut it out um, oh, wow. with this cutting knife. So and you put a hundred layers? Yeah. Of, how yep. thick would that be? Cause this is- Yeah, this so is, it's you probably know. about, you know, something like Whoa, that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, you definitely get a great economy of scale, even though it is a manual process. Um, you do still get a real good economy of scale on that cut. How different is this process compared to what it was back in the 50s? Yeah, has you know what? Much or? Has not changed hardly at all. Wow. Yeah. Is yeah. that I a mean, good one thing, of the you few think? Things. That, I well, mean, I mean, I, I think everything's a function of cost. And, and part of the thing, they obviously have uh, machines that will come and they will cut it. You mm -hmm. know, you can have a machine that automatically cuts it out itself, but not when it's that thick. That's like a few layers high that it would do that. We have not seen anything to this point as high as, as thick as we cut this material, that would be able to do it without being having a manual presence. Let's talk about the employees. How many employees do you have on both sides of the business? Whatever you can share in terms of what their average pay is on the manufacturing mm -hmm. side versus screen printing. We have about 25 employees total. Now we have, you know, our graphic artist, our screen printer and, and screen printing assistant, you know, it's probably about nine on the promo and apparel side and, you know, whatever that would leave, 16 mm -hmm. on the manufacturing <clears throat> side. So definitely more on the apron side. Yeah. How does the pay differ? Pay differs from the standpoint of on our promo and apparel side, we have, we have a salary and then we mm -hmm. have commission over and above salary. And so, okay. you know, you, you have that ability to go I mean, obviously, the more you sell, the more you make. So mm -hmm. we don't have any of that. There is no commission on the manufacturing side. How much do they get paid, at least on this manufacturing side, the sewers and everybody else? Yeah, involved? you know, they're probably in the, um, you know, depending on experience, depending on what they're doing, they're in the, you know, $20 an hour, okay. you know, range and up. I mean, so that's kind of where we're, kind of where we're at over here. Brent, when you came into this family business and took over essentially, mm -hmm. uh, what changes were made? Why were they made? And how did that impact the business? Good question. I, I think, you know, when you think about bringing on someone new to your business, one of the best things you get from that is a new set of eyes on the business, right? right. And so I had the ability to have an amazing mentor and my father who had been building the business and was, it was definitely growing. But, you know, I was probably able to just bring in, frankly, some youth and some excitement. And we recently brought in our daughter a couple of years ago, and it's the same thing. But, you know, really, it was just the energy for me to go out and hit the road and go sell our product. I mean, so really, it was it was sales. It was top line revenue generation, uh, which is where everything has to start in a business. I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't have revenue, it doesn't matter how well you run or how efficient you are. If you don't have revenue, you know, you don't have a business. Awesome. You guys, if you want to hear more tried and true business advice from incredible people like Brent, check out our podcast that just went live, upflip.com forward slash podcast, where we talk about how to build a team, organization, and increase your revenue. Check it out. With your knowledge and experience, though, what would you think it would cost today to get something started similar to this? I mean, on a small scale, right? You know, you're probably gonna need rent of, you know, at least 10 grand a month, depending right. on how big a facility you're gonna, you're gonna get. But you can finance, you can finance equipment. You still gotta have cash to run your business and that alone, you're gonna want 
you know, available cash. So I, I would say, you know, something like a manufacturing business. And again, it depends on what size, but yeah, you're going to need, you know, you're going to need 300,000 bucks. I mean, okay. to, to put together all of the kind of equipment you're talking about and, and the, the staffing, the people to run it, um, that makes sense. you know, making payroll every two weeks for business owners, you know, they know that's, if you've never had to make payroll every two weeks, that's a whole different thing in running a business. I mean, mm -hmm. people that have just worked for a business that have never had to worry about actually writing checks every two weeks, you got to have the cash, you got to make sure these people's lives are dependent on it. You know, there, there's a pressure and a stress that comes with that. What happens once it's cut and you pull it out? Uh, where yeah, the so, and so once, once we cut it, it comes off the table on a cart. Okay. And then, uh, then we, we bring the cart over and then we come over to our sewing machines. They get dispersed onto the machines. You know, this is what a finished apron looks like here. Hmm. And uh, right now it's just getting what we would call a bar tack that just, this. just comes in here, right in there, a little bar tack that solidifies that. Can Here's you your in? bar tack right there. So it just puts that into the side just so these don't pull out. It gives that extra reinforcement. These girls sew, you know, at least 300 aprons a day. Wow, each total? Oh, each. Each, wow. yeah. If, and then it comes over and we'll fold them, uh, get them folded, and then get them boxed into whatever box configuration they're going to go out the door. And they get bagged up and wrapped up with shrink wrap, and off they go. You'd survive in a hurricane wearing this thing. You it's bet. pretty darn thick. You fake. bet. That's the idea, yeah. Wow. So how's the seasonality of, of this business, right? Both sides. Um, what's a busy month in terms of dollars? What's a slow month in terms of dollars? And how do you shift in those really slow seasons, especially last year with mm -hmm. all the craziness going on? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Definitely fourth quarter, I would say for both sides of the business is our busiest quarter. It's our highest revenue quarter. Uh, on, on the manufacturing side for the aprons, that's when a lot of supermarket chains hire more people in the stores because mm -hmm. of the holidays, so we sell more aprons. And the same thing, you get a lot of year-end gifts to employees, to customers, that kind of thing on the promo side of the business and, and the printing side. So that is by far the busiest time of our year. COVID was a challenge for everybody on the, right. on the promo side, on the printing and you know, promo and apparel side, you know, all of a sudden one of your biggest vehicles for selling product, which is events, went it's away. Gone. I would say that's where we were very fortunate to have the other division of the business. We were fortunate that supermarkets actually really, I mean, they were having all time record sales at supermarkets because yeah. people couldn't go to restaurants. So huge for us from that standpoint of helping buoy us through that, through that season. And we did fortunately have enough customers that we're still doing some things. It just, the way you did projects for companies changed drastically. It now, you had to ship to every customer individually. You right. weren't shipping to an office. How many employees do you have and what do you do to, to, to run and manage the team in terms of employees and workflow, et cetera? What can you sure. tell us on that? So uh, as far as production, we pretty have a pretty small team, about three or four people, depending on what's in-house in and who we need to bring in to add to that production team or that production schedule. Salespeople-wise, we have about seven salespeople. Some are wow. part-time, some are full-time. Um, some from home, some from the office? Exactly. You do? Okay. More, more home. Like even our graphics department people are, have been working from home since COVID. And gotcha. that's worked out really well. That's okay. Yeah. Good. But obviously for production, we got to have hands on. We got to have people here. So, uh, but a lot of our sales team is working from home and has continued to. Unless a lot of times we got to come in and check on orders ourselves too, do press checks press groups for our customers, so mm -hmm. in that sense, they'd come in too. Any experience, tips, tricks that you can share with our audience in terms of just running a great team uh, in the apparel promo side? Yeah, I think a lot of communication, education. Uh, a lot of times I'm the go-between between, between our suppliers or manufacturers, what new products are up. A lot of times they're so busy talking to their customers or writing up orders, they don't have time to really do the sourcing and the researching. So. Mm -hmm. I try and really uh, reach out to them on that, new products, educating, getting us signed up for out-of-town events where we can learn more too, gotcha. and setting up with our reps from other suppliers. 
how do you maintain such a great reputation with all your customers? And what's your number one tip for great customer service? Customer service is what truly builds your business, right? Anybody can make a product and sell it once, but if you can't get That's repeat true. business, you don't have a business. And so it's funny, my dad had a saying that was ruthless delivery. That's really what we've kind of focused on here is, granted, we have a typical lead time, which might be you know two weeks on the manufacturing side. So we always try to stick within that if we can. There's going to be times that you're not going to be able to make that. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing and the way you build long-term relationships is how you react when there's a problem. Interesting. Every, when everything's going great, it, it's really easy. But it's when we have a mistake on an order, whether we ship the wrong product, we ship not enough product, it's significantly late, whatever that might happen to be. How do you follow that up? How do you stand behind your product? And that's just something we have always looked at that we are in this for the long term. It's far less expensive to keep a customer than it's ever going to be to go find a new one. Mm -hmm. So even if it's going to cost you in the short term, you got to find a way to make that customer happy. And frankly, that's where you solidify relationships is when something goes wrong. Let's talk about inventory for both sides of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a system in place that allows you to manage it? Yeah, you bet. I mean, inventory is uh, incredibly important and, and can be incredibly costly. You need to have in-house always available to you, yet you don't want to be sitting on months worth of inventory because it's, it's cash. And, you know, for small business, I mean, cash is king. Cash is everything. And as it is with every company, but for small business in particular, cash is what keeps the doors open. And so you have to be very careful about either making sure you're not sitting on inventory that isn't moving or just too much inventory. And it's interesting. We, we have a customer management system on our promo and apparel side that's called mm -hmm. Common SKU. Okay. And so we run that on that side of the business. We run a software system called Profit Maker on the manufacturing side that has a built-in inventory component to that. Everything is already input into the system and that's how we create our POs and that kind of thing. And then everything is received once it comes in the door and then it's a running tally in the system. Everything is built for, you know, for example, our apron products down to the amount of thread, a oh, grommet, everything. Um, everything is built into that apron. So every time one ships out, it pulls that out of the system. Once it's in a box, what happens? I'm guessing over there, that looks like a shipping area. Yep, so our shipping area over here, and we'll either ship small package, whether it's UPS or FedEx. Our main trucking company, if we're gonna put it on a pallet and wrap it up, oh, wow, our okay. main trucking company is FedEx Freight. So okay. that's who we use mainly for our LTL shipments. So most of our small package shipping on the manufacturing side of the business is done through UPS. Okay, <clears throat> smaller ones. Smaller ones, however, we also use FedEx Express because we were able to, with all of the shipping we're now doing directly to cust or, uh, employees' homes versus mm -hmm. shipping the whole load to an office, we now ship, everybody's at home, has been at home, we ship directly to their homes. <clears throat> we were able to get a really good rate with a big envelope size from FedEx Express okay. that we can get as much in that envelope and ship it out at a set price. So they're beating UPS on that part. They're better than UPS on that. Tara, tell us about the supply chain for the promo side of the business versus manufacturing. Like, what are the differences, right? Where do you get them? How do you find the best deal? Things like that. So the suppliers are totally different on both sides. It's really two separate businesses. The only thing we're sharing is the screen printing. Our suppliers are totally different than the apron suppliers. It's material that we are literally sewing into aprons. And on this side, we're purchasing from the manufacturers making the t-shirts. We're purchasing the ink from people that make the ink. And then we're doing all the decoration in-house. I don't know if this is a valid question, but is it harder to get supplies for this business versus that one, or they're about the same? Uh, I, since COVID, yeah. it's, it's a little more difficult on this side. On um, this side? Absolutely, absolutely. Just shortages uh, of teas and exactly, stuff like that? Exactly, shortages of teas. About a month ago, we could not find white basic teas to save our wow. lives. So we're, we're kind of, it's filling in a little bit, but we're having the same issues everybody else is out there. 
Brent, what's next for this company? What are you seeing for the next three to five years? We're really buoyed right now. I mean, it, it's been interesting as a manufacturer. I mean, we have a facility in China that we deal with mm -hmm. and, and we bring in a lot of finished product from. Um, that has helped us over the years in many regards because business goes through cycles. And we definitely went through the cycle where people wanted it made in the USA. Then everybody wanted it for the absolute bare minimum price they could get it. And that's not going to happen in the USA. Mm -hmm. So we went to China. We established relationships over there with, with a factory in particular. What's happened now with, with supply issues and tariffs and everything that's going on in COVID-19 and the lack of uh, ships and containers coming to the U.S. is people want to buy almost out of necessity right now made in the USA. And our mm. largest customer basically came to us and said, we want everything made in the USA. And this is going back almost six years now about they came to us and we'd probably been bringing in 80% of their product from overseas. They said, we want everything made domestically. So that has provided us a great opportunity right now to what we want to do is increase our product availability of not only aprons, but being able to sew other products on this side. And then the promo and apparel side of the business, that's just a function of selling more product. You know, right. I mean, it's always more selling more product, but again, it's, it's what type of, you know, what industry do you want to sell to that kind of thing. And so that's where we've been spending time. Where do we want to sell our product? Where are growth opportunities? This is a big question with our viewers, and that is either partners or family members working together. So how, do you, how did you figure out that balance yeah. of family work, life? What are some tips, tricks, and experiences you can share with us that we can implement in our world as well? First of all, I would say I, I've been incredibly blessed because my dad made it incredibly easy for me to come into the business. I, I think as the younger generation entering a family business, it really is gonna depend on how the older generation uh, accepts you coming in. If, mm -hmm. if they're going to say, if they're going to have the, the attitude of more, this is my business, this is how it's going to be done, this is how it's always done, I call the shots, you're in and you can give me input, but I'm going to do what I want to do, that would be really challenging. I did not have that. I have a number of friends that had that in going into family businesses that it was very challenging. Right. My experience couldn't have been better. As I say, I was extremely fortunate that my dad was willing to hear what I had to say. And if I could lay it out in a way that made sense, then he'd be willing to make a change. Okay. And, um, so he was you know, hard headed, I guess. Or, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. And gave grace, right? I mean, at the end of the day, he gave grace because yeah, I'd worked in the family business growing up, but there was a lot of things I didn't know. Right. I mean, all of a sudden now I'm much more in a position coming from commercial real estate where you're managing no one but yourself. Now I'm coming in and we've got employees and how does that look? Mm -hmm. And so I had so much to learn. Um, and he was just a fantastic mentor and allowed me to grow and allowed me to feel I had some responsibility, which I think is important to everybody. You guys, Blitz Time with Brent. Brent, lead. these are our fan-based questions. Thank you guys for submitting these questions. This is from Daniel Alexander. Uh, asking how did you come up with the business idea? Well, my grandfather had it, had a buddy that had the material, said figure out something to make out of this material, and he came up with aprons and rain jackets. There you go. This is from Trent Uskoski. Um, how in-depth did you, did you go with your standard operating procedures and training manuals? Definitely not a 10-second answer. We'll give you a little bit more, but what can you say on that? Uh, that that's critical, by the way, is uniformity is everything. Mm -hmm. and, and so... I think a lot of that is just built over time. You're going to continue to modify it, but um, Makes sense. through experience is basically how that comes together. Okay. This is from Garrett Stevenson. Thank you, Garrett. Um, how can, he says, how can we get started? Any recommendations? Yeah, I think if you're talking about whether it's screen printing or whatever, I mean, there's yes. always the question of the chicken or the egg, right? Do you, do you need to know how to screen print first or do you need to have customers first? And the answer is you got to know how to screen print because if you're going to go tell somebody you can do it and then you can't, yeah, then that's not going to work. So, you know, whether it's watching YouTube, I, I know we've had a screen printer here that learned how to print on YouTube. And then either you need to bring in a salesperson or you got to be able to sell too. But eventually you're going to need two because you got to print while they're selling. Got it. Well, we talked earlier in the video about a hack, something you're willing to share with our viewers. Um, take it away. 
And thank you. Oh, absolutely, Paul, absolutely. I, I, my hack would be you, you have to get to the point that you can get an economy of scale. I mm -hmm. mean, if, if you're talking about whether it's screen printing, whether it's making apron products, you, you can't be doing a dozen or two dozen or even a hundred. I mean, and believe me, I mean, that it's gonna take time to grow that, but as quickly as you can, you need to move to economy of scale because that's, that's what's gonna allow you to be around for a while. If you're gonna consistently try to do just a few pieces here and there, and you're gonna do a great job, you're not gonna make any money. And, and then the second thing up, in, in response to that would be, you have got to provide customer service all the way through the selling cycle with your product. So you gotta stand behind it, you gotta be willing to back it up at all costs. Brent, what's your favorite business book? Why and how's it helped you just become a better person? Yeah, uh, I would say the, the most recent book I read was, uh, it's called Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. It talks about her le leadership style, which is far more empathetic. And I think in today's workforce, uh, it's just incredibly important with, uh, there's a lot of people that have been dealing with different emotions and different things through COVID and learning how to lead maybe with a softer heart and in, in different ways to approach people, I think has been critical. That's awesome. For people watching who can't make up their mind on which customer to pursue or which mm. avenue to go with yeah. to get their name out, what would you tell them? And any pieces of advice just to entrepreneurs in general Yeah. with the experience you have? You know, I, I do think sending out emails and stuff like that is, is great, but you gotta get to the right person. So the more you can, if you know somebody that works at that company, find out who's making decisions mm. on making the orders that you would talk to. Try to try to get in that way because sending mm. the blank emails and the blank things, you're not targeting, yeah, right? Just junk mail. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna go to junk. If I'm going into business that I just happen to really like, and I'll say, oh, you know, I do this, I do this kind of thing. I'd love to do a small order for free and just show you mm -hmm. what we can do, show you nice. the the quality of our stuff. If it goes somewhere, great. And if it doesn't, no big deal. Or if you have already have somebody else that you're working with, no problem. Just let me show you what we can do. And if you still want to stick with what you are, no problem. In general, though, people are well, really happy no. with what we do and how we do it and our customer service. So knock on those doors, whether it's virtually or through connections of somebody that you know that works at the company. If you have the resources to kind of do a one a freebie, mm -hmm. That, That's that a good way to get people in. People love to see, you know, have things in their hand. People love to see their own logo on something in their own hand. And more than likely, they'll put through an order with you. That's a wrap. What an incredible episode with the owners of this family business, Lock Name, right behind me. They've been in business since 1946. You guys, comment below. We'd love to hear from you what you've learned, what you're doing different. We read them all. And if you haven't already, like, subscribe, hit that bell so that you don't miss any of our incredible content as we do it all for you. Thank you.